Good morning, everyone. Happy. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday morning. Glad that you're able to join us. Um, we're going to get started in just a second. I'll show a little video. And then we will get going. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. We are Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online community for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. PST, and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. PST. If you aren't able to attend the event, all our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section in Zoom and our team members will read them and have them answered. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you'll be awarded a two-hour mentorship certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or want to tell your pre-med friends about pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at pre-med CC. Welcome everyone. So Madeline Babb began her academic career at Santa Barbara City College majoring in biological sciences. She served as president of the SBCC Biology Club, secretary for the pre-med club, and as a math and biology tutor. In 2019, Madeline transferred to the University of California, Los Angeles, and graduated summa cum laude with a degree in molecular cell and developmental biology and a minor in genetics and society. She took two gap years and worked as a Mohs surgery histology technician and served on the pre-med CCC leadership team. She is now a first-year medical student at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Madeline's special interests include medical humanities, gastroenterology, and decreasing disparities in medical education. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back on a pre-med CC meeting. It's been a while. Um, so I did prepare some slides for today so I can share those just to um, give us something and, you know, introduce myself. Jubin, do I have access to screen share? Oh, yes, I do. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see everything okay? Perfect. Okay. So, yeah, um, this is just going to be a little bit of an overview about my journey, and then I want to open it up to Q&A so that anyone can ask the specific questions that they have, um, whether that be about transferring, taking the MCAT, um, just how to be a, you know, applying to medical school in general. I know it's pretty daunting, so let's get going. So just a little bit of background about who I am. Um, so I'm a former community college student, and then also I'm now a current um, first-year medical student at University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Um, I'm also a UCLA graduate, so I transferred to UCLA in fall of 2019 and then graduated in uh, the winter uh, quarter of 2021. And then, as said before, I'm the former president of Pre-Med CC, so I was involved for a little over two years, and I'm still still connected with Pre-Med CC, but not in a leadership position anymore. Um, so as you can see, I have this little, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I've always known that I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I've always wanted to go into medicine, but... Uh, for a little while there, I wasn't sure if it was going to be possible, especially coming from a community college. Um, I didn't know any doctors who had started off at CC, so it was a little um, scary back then. So I remember being in your guys' place and um, happy to say that it's definitely possible. So let's see. Oh, skip forward ahead. So um, just a little bit more about my academic journey. So I actually started off at Ventura College, which was the um, community college that was closest to me. 
Um, I went there for about three years and I was just kind of floating. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, although I had wanted to be a doctor, like I said before, I hadn't done that well in high school. And then I didn't go immediately to a uh, college or university. So I didn't think it was an option. I really didn't know um, what else I would do. So I was at Ventura College for three years, um, just kind of floating around. I actually ended up on academic probation because I didn't, um, some of my classes I stopped going to and got W's in. And then because I had more W's than completed credits, that put me onto academic probation. So that wasn't ideal. But then um, in my last year there, I kind of had a, a moment where I realized, you know what, I really, I've always wanted to be a doctor and I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to go back to that and I'm going to make that happen. So I went and I spoke to an academic counselor at Ventura College, and he helped me kind of formulate a plan uh, for how I would be able to transfer so that I could go to a four-year university and then, um, you know, eventually go on to medical school. So it was a little bit daunting. I had already been at uh, Ventura College for over two years at that point. And then in my third year, I had that meeting and he said, it's going to take another three years for you to be able to transfer and to finish all the um, science and math requirements that you need to have a bachelor's of science degree. So that was definitely scary. But um, I knew it's what I wanted to do. And I decided that I was just going to make it happen. So part of that was um, I also realized that uh, a nearby community college about 45 minutes away from me was Santa Barbara City College. And they had a much more rigorous academic program when it comes to like biological sciences, um, especially biomedical sciences. They had their own um, voc vocational nursing program. They had access to cadavers. They had um, they had access to a lot of microbiology, a lot of classes that um, weren't really offered at Ventura College. So that inspired me to transfer over to Santa Barbara City College and make the drive every day so that I could be a little bit more competitive and get some more experiences. So I transferred over to SBCC um, and that was when I was really focusing on uh on biology. So I wanted to major in biology because they said for if you want to go to medical school, you have to major in biology, which isn't completely true, but um, it does it does help with prereqs. So I did that. Um, I completed my IAGETSI at Santa Barbara City College, which, which is um, all the like general education transfer courses you need. And then I also worked on my medical school pre prerequisites. So that's an um, important thing to note is that I actually did all of my med school prereqs at community college. And that's totally fine. I think the only ones I took once I transferred was biochemistry and genetics. Some schools require genetics, but then everything else um, I took at community college. And that's totally fine. Not going to hurt you at all. And then after um, two years at SBCC, I transferred to um, UCLA. So at UCLA, I was a major in molecular cell and developmental biology. And then I also minored in society and genetics. And um, I graduated summa cum laude from can, UCLA. Can you explain to them what summa cum laude is? Yeah, so that's summa cum laude is there's different um there's there's different uh levels of honors for grade wise. So um you can do be cum laude, which means you're in the top, I believe, 15% of your class. You can be magna cum laude, which is in the top um I'll just tell him what was your GPA graduating from UCLA. <laughs> He's just looking for the numbers. Um I did get a 4.0 at UCLA, and that means I was in summa cum laude, but I could, you didn't have to have a perfect 4.0 to do that. And then also, um, t you know, when I was applying for medical school, I did not have a 4.0 GPA um, because of all of those W's that I had talked about earlier. I actually got a few F's. I think there was two F's scattered in there. So then my GPA went way down for applying to medical school and it was fine. It's no problem. Um, but yeah, it was nice to be able to say that. It's nice to have have an upward trend on your GPA, I will say that. Okay, so um, moving on, I included this, this was from a talk that I did with um, Trinity a couple, gosh, I guess over a year ago, but um, just our, about the MCAT study time. So after I graduated from UCLA, as I said, I kind of finished a little bit early, I was able to get all of my um, like course requirements done, and give myself one extra quarter off. So I didn't have for my senior year, I finished in winter instead of spring. So I used the spring quarter that time to um, study for the MCAT. I also did some volunteering, but um, most of it was studying for the MCAT. So I started in May on Kaplan Content Review, those books that you can find anywhere. I just grabbed some of those books and I went through them one by one, every chapter, writing notes. I do not recommend that now. Looking back on it, that was kind of a waste of my time. But um, at the time, I was looking for a way to study and that that 
seemed to work. So I did that for about a month, just going through those books. And then um, I started taking full length exams, which in hindsight, I wish I would have started with practice questions a lot earlier than just spending that month and a half of doing um, practice or doing like content review. Then um, I took my first AMC full length in July. And then um, I took a little vacation break uh, where I did not study at all the week, two weeks before my exam, which I felt very, very guilty about at the time. But in hindsight, I think that definitely was helpful. And it um, helped me calm down and kind of be able to focus on the big picture of life instead of just focusing on the MCAT, which was kind of consuming everything at that that point. Um, so yeah, then I took my uh, final full length uh, three day, two days before my exam. And then I took my exam in August. So I spent about three months doing review and different, um, either doing content review or doing practice questions. I did not use Anki at all. Um, that is something that stuck with me. I still don't use Anki. Even in med school, everyone's, you'll, you'll find that people are either extremely pro Anki and that's all they'll do. Or then they're like me. And it's just, I do not like Anki and I never did. So if you don't like Anki and you're studying for the MCAT, that's, that's okay. And if you do like it, that's also okay. So here's a little bit about my gap years. This is not a picture of me, but I thought she kind of looked like me. So I <laughs> included that one. Um, but I volunteered at a free clinic. So I was able to find this when I was at um, UCLA, even though COVID hit in the middle of my transfer experience, um, there were still a lot of opportunities. So I volunteered with a club called um, UMA, UMA Community Clinic, and they had a free low cost clinic in South Central LA. So I volunteered there and I really enjoyed it. I thought it um, it really kind of opened my eyes to working with underserved populations and medical humanities. So I think that um, was extremely helpful. Then I also assisted with uh, vaccine distribution with them when the COVID vaccine finally um, came out towards the end of my undergraduate. So like I said, I finished in, I think this was April, 2020. Yeah, April, 2021, um, the vaccines became widely available. So then I was still volunteering with that clinic and helped with that. I didn't uh, personally administer the vaccines, but I would kind of counsel patients and just explain what the vaccine was, get um, their signatures at the time we needed, you know, all of their information. So I would just do that. Um, and then after that, I started working as a Mohs histology technician. So this is kind of one of those weird clinical experiences that are not super clinical, but they'll give you really valuable experience. Um, I was working in dermatology offices and they, uh, it was a special type of surgery where they kind of removed like a skin cancer, like the tumor, and then they would bring it back to a lab. And then I was in charge of taking the skin cancer tumor, slicing it up with this frozen machine and turning it into pathology slides that the doctor then could read and see like, okay, yes, there's still cancer here or there's no cancer here anymore. Um, and they would go back to the patients and do another, like they'd call them layers. So if there was still skin cancer, they would take another one and then send it back to me. Um, but it was a really cool experience. It was really different. And then it's also been very helpful in medical school now having that experience because um, histology, so learning how to look at slides and um, understand what you're seeing in histology slides is a lot of my classmates really, really struggle with it. But I'd been doing it for two years through my gap year job. Um, so that's that's helpful. And then also knowing how to work those deli slicer cryostat machines that are pictured right here for medical research is just it's a skill that took me at least eight months working full time to master. So to be able to go into medical school with that already under my belt and having experience training people in it is super helpful. So um, yeah, my gap year job was definitely unique, but I feel like it gave me some really good insight. And then also I'm kind of considering dermatology. I'm, I don't know, we'll see when I take step two, but um, <laughs> well, uh, it's still good to have that experience if I do decide to do that path. So then um, I also worked as the president of pre-med CC during my gap years, um, which was an invaluable experience. I got to listen to uh, deans of admissions talking about exactly what they're looking for in applicants while I was myself an applicant. So that was that was really helpful. Um, but you don't have to be president to get all that experience. You can just come to as many sessions as you want to and you'll get all of that those insights. And then I also got engaged to um, the love of my life, Spencer. There's a picture of the two of us. Um, we were taking some engagement photos. And then I also, I met him at community college and the two of us transferred together. And now he, um, at the time he was considering PA, but when we met, but not anymore. So he's actually working in biotechnology. Um, he's a microbiologist at Bosch and Loam, which is a contact company in Rochester. So yeah, uh, you don't have to, if you're bio, you don't have to do medicine. There's a lot of jobs in, um, you also don't have to do academics. There's a lot of jobs in biotech. 
and industry. So switching on here is medical school. So um, there's a picture of my parents and Spencer and I at uh, my white coat ceremony. So that was a very exciting day. I'm currently an MS1 at University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. I love my school. I love all the people. Um, I'm really, really happy to be out here. I like Rochester a lot too, even though today is today is a beautiful sunny day, but it's also freezing. Literally, I think it's like 20 degrees outside. <laughs> but you wouldn't be able to tell by looking out the window. It looks really pretty. Um, there's no snow on the ground, which is different. Um, for as compared to the last couple of months, <laughs> it's very snowy and cold here, but I still, um, I've really been enjoying it. And uh, so at my school, every school is going to be a little bit different, but for preclinical years, typically it's either going to be the first year, year and a half or two years of um, your medical school education. So I'm, my school does it where the first two years for us are preclinical, but even though we're mostly, um, when I say preclinical, that's like you're learning from textbooks, you're going to lectures, you're learning from, um, it's like classes, typical classes versus clinical years are when you're doing clinical rotations in the hospital. So even though uh, my school technically, you don't start your official clinical rotations until your third year, I've been doing clinical, ro I've been doing like mini clinical rotations where we go and um, I just was yesterday, I was in the ICU interviewing a patient, listening to their, um, just kind of like working with a doctor. It was almost like a little bit hands-on shadowing where um, you get to learn and, and see what the doctor's doing. Um, so my school really starts incorporating that pretty early, which has been really nice. And then also we work with a lot of standardized patients. So we're learning interview skills, how to um, clinical skills. We get to listen to heart sounds and um, just start to familiarize ourselves with that. So my first semester was anatomy, physiology, and histology. It's called human structure and function. And we just learn everything there is to learn about um, the body. It was a lot of information. I had already taken anatomy. I had already, like I said before, I already had a lot of histology experience and it still was just, it was a lot. Um, they really, people say medical school is like drinking out of a fire hose. And they were, they're correct. Um, they're really not lying when it comes to that. It's just, it's an immense amount of information. Um, but you start to learn how to, how to put it all together. And then I'm currently in my second semester. So right now um, we did biochemistry, we did genetics. I'm currently in cell biology. And then up next is pharmacology and immunology. So all of these classes are just scattered. Um, and then scattered within all of these classes is you also had had a classes um, take classes on how to like perform and practice medicine. Like I was saying before, those are when I'm working with standardized patients. Um, that's when you're going to the hospital, practicing interview skills. So those are, um, those are kind of woven into our curriculum. Every school is a little bit different. Um, but this is, this is how my school does it. Um, and I really like how they do it. Another thing that I wanted, I didn't put this on the slide, but, um, I wanted to mention some schools have absolutely mandatory lectures. So you need to be there every single day or they'll have small group classes. Some schools have barely anything in person. Um, it really depends on the school. And my school is you don't have to go to lectures. I personally do just because I feel like it keeps me on top of everything um, and it keeps me engaged in the classes. Plus, I don't like rewatching the lectures later on my own time. I feel like I never want to. So I personally like to be there and um, hear everything firsthand. And then I feel like I study, I don't need to study quite as much. I still have to study a lot, but I can, if I have that uh, like introduction in person, I retain it a lot better. And then also my school does um, small group learning. So a lot of schools do this where it's called PBL, problem-based learning. Um, you're in a small group and they'll kind of give you like a clinical scenario and then everyone works through it together. So you um, discuss, you know, the ethics of the case, you discuss what you think is happening. Um, so that's really cool. And that those are mandatory. And then also in my first semester, when I had physiology, we did um, cadaver dissection. So we were working in the anatomy lab and all of that was mandatory. But again, every school is different. So some, and even my school, there's a lot of variance. So, so, you know, I have some classmates where I've maybe seen them. I see them during exams and I see them sometimes um, during mandatory lectures, but then for the most part, I just, I don't see them in I think I was talking to someone, he only comes on campus maybe once or twice a week and that's fine. Um, so everyone just kind of finds what works for them. Okay, and then um, here's what's next for me. This picture cracked me up. Um, I decided to include it because everyone's very calm for doing CPR, but I also like how the medical students just standing there taking notes, I guess. 
But um, anyway, what's next for me is uh, getting involved with research. So I'm currently um, onboarding for a research project for a clinical, um, a clinical research project for a medical device. So it's pretty exciting and um, I'm really hoping all goes well there. And then also I want to start shadowing more physicians. So I've been able, once you start medical school, it's a lot easier to shadow um, because you have clearance, you've done all of your um, like required modules on like basic life skills and things like that. So you you have clearance and they don't really have to, um, I know when you're like in a pre-med, reaching out and trying to find physicians who will let you shadow them can be a little bit challenging. So yeah, once you're a med student, that all goes away. You can just go up to a professor after lecture who's also an MD and be like, hey, I really liked your lecture. Can I shadow you? And for the most part, they're um, they're really willing to let you let you follow them around. I also want to get um, involved in more leadership opportunities. So my school has a lot of different uh, student interest groups and different specialties. So I've sent in a couple applications that I'm waiting to hear back from. Um, my school has a medical student clinic. Most schools also do have some sort of um, medical student clinic. So we have one and I'm trying to get more involved with them. Um, I volunteered with them a couple of times, but my first um, semester was really, really intense and like rigorous academically. So I didn't do as much then. And now that it's the second semester, I have a lot more free time. So trying to get more involved. Um, I want to work with more patients. That's just something that I think it's one of those skills where you just got to keep going and keep meeting people and working on your interview skills. And um, so that's something I'm working on. And then I'm also getting married this summer. So that's really exciting. Um, our wedding date is going to be June 28th, 2024. And we're going back home to California to um, to get married on the beach. So I think that's all I have. But I can open it up to um, can open it up to some Q and A questions. If we, I don't think we have any yet, but if people have anything they want to ask, anyone have any questions? Because um, we could always hit her up, but this is a chance for you guys to ask questions. Um, uh, I have one question. If you had to do everything all over again, what would you do? I would get involved in research right away. That's, <laughs> that's, I keep, I know I, I say that one a lot, but honestly, that, um, that's something that I think was, that's something that even to this day, I, I didn't have a research heavy application, which is fine because I really do like medical humanities. I like working with underserved populations. So it hasn't been a problem. But it's also having a research experience really will help you in medical school. I'm not exactly sure why, to be honest, but it's just something that they really do want to see on applications. So getting involved with research, if I could go back in time, I think that would have been the biggest thing. Even at community college, there's, um, I know we've, Pre-Med CC has done a lot of um, talks on that, how there's different research opportunities you can be doing during the summer or that you can... Um, you know, get involved with if you're taking gap years. So I would have definitely have sought those out early. I didn't realize how big of a part of the application process research was. All right. Next question. Uh, what is medical humanities? Yeah, medical humanities. Um, so this is like a really wide topic. There's a lot of different parts that go into medical humanities. So that can be bioethics um, is a big part of it. Working with disadvantaged groups is a big part of medical humanities. History of medicine. Medicine has a very um, interesting and not so pretty history. So I think there's a lot of work on recognizing some of the injustices that have happened historically in medicine to make sure that they don't happen again. Um, I actually, for my school, I just finished up a class called um, Embedding Ethics. And so we were focused, it was a small group class where we were working on, um, we we're talking about how genetic technologies um, have developed and how they are developing and the potential um, issues that could arise if some of these technologies become more common or um, used. So example, we just had a very spirited debate on CRISPR and using CRISPR for gene editing. So that's, you know, if you could edit your child to not be able um, to be protected from catching certain diseases, what are the ethical ramifications of that where some people can afford this and some people can't? Um, it just creates, it's a whole new world. So 
you know, even, and then also gene therapies, what are the ethics there? Um, there's a lot of problems with some of the science that we're still figuring out. So just that's medical humanities all kind of encompasses all of that, but then also it can be other things. Um, some of my classmates are in a special pathway program for medical humanities, and they're looking at legal perspectives. They're looking at even arts. Um, and it, it's really, it's a wide, wide umbrella, but, um, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting stuff. All right. So our next question is, how are you able to manage your time? So there's like schoolwork, volunteering, community service. Um, I guess this is like maybe how you like manage your time, like at UCLA and then now like, um, as a med student, if that changed at all. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely changed. So I think a lot of it is trying to be organized, um, which I'm not always successful at, but, <laughs> but, you know, having grades for that. So for schoolwork, I would set aside specific time that I was going to be studying. Um, if I had a weekend, I typically what I do even now is I like to give myself a little bit more time just for life things and fun things on Saturday. So today I'm not planning on studying at all today and that's okay. But then tomorrow I am hitting the books um, pretty hard and I'll probably end up studying for like 10 hours straight. But um, that's pers that's how I like to do it. I had a lot of friends that that's not their preferred way. So although I'm fine with sitting down and studying for a very long block of time, if that doesn't work for you, that's fine. I think it's about setting aside time. You know, you can set two hours here, two hours there um, and spread it out a little bit more. And then also, even when I'm doing those long study sessions, I, I do give myself breaks. So it's not just completely studying straight. I don't have the attention span for that. But I think it's helpful um, making a schedule too of your day. So that's something that I've definitely been doing a lot more in medical school is using my Google calendar and using my um, just organizing exactly all of my time commitments, because otherwise you can have overlap and um, you might just not have enough time in general. And then also for balancing schoolwork, I would recommend trying to give yourself a lighter week if you know that you have a lot of, um, if you have an exam at the end of the week. So giving yourself more time during the, you know, maybe do your volunteering earlier the weekend before, or, you know, just keeping that um, week of the exam or at least the first couple, the days right before the exam free so that you're um, able to focus on that. So, yeah. Next question. I am having a hard time knowing how many hours I should commit to various activities like shadowing and community service. Do you have any advice? Yeah, definitely. So that's, it's difficult because I think everybody has such, you know, I would look online and I would see people with shadowing hours and they said, you need to have at least 150 plus shadowing hours to apply to medical school. I will tell you right now, I had zero applying to medical school. Um, <laughs> I did not have any official shadowing hours, although my job did allow me to shadow physicians in an informal setting. And I was able to talk about that in my application. Um, I didn't have a set number of hours. And I think that's something that medical schools aren't really, from what I what I understand of it, they're not really looking for, okay, you need to have this amount of hours and this amount of um, experience, hours in this experience in order to be to show that you know how they're going to understand if you actually know it or not is how you talk about your experiences, how you present yourself in the personal statement, how you can talk about them in interviews. So it's hard to give a specific number because it varies so much. And then also you, you know, we're not machines. You're going to have any applicants going to have a few more hours in research or a few more hours in community service as opposed to others. So there's, um, there's a balance to these things. So I don't, it is difficult to give an exact number because I think it really does vary on the applicant. So yeah, it's, it's a little tricky. I would say that you want to show that you've had some experiences. So but yeah. Also, Jubin, yeah, do you have so, any yeah. You just have to look at it too. If you're someone that needs to study more time, like you need to put more time in your studying, then that's what you're going to have to do. But there is no, I mean, there's no, number of hours is that you know you need to be able to have those experiences and write about it and have some sort of interaction and something that and also like maybe using those um you know things to get a letter now if you're shadowing somebody for 20 hours you shouldn't get a letter from them because 
they don't know you that long. But if let's say you spent two years at a community service project um, and you've, you know, showed up as a volunteer, became a training person and then took a leadership role, then that's like significantly more. And those hours are gonna gonna depend. So there's no X amount, there's no magic number. It's not like you need to have a prerequisite of these classes. Um, but you should have good quality that you interact with someone to get a good letter from them. And as they say, like to get a letter from someone, you should spend at least like, you know, at least six months to know these people on and you know, and it, it all varies too. So there's no magic number. Yeah. And I think you're going to have a, there will be like a balance of, you know, maybe your application's a little bit more heavy on community service and that's okay. Um, it's all about finding that balance, but like Jubin was saying, you really, you know, you do want to make sure that you're putting enough time into your academics. So if you need to study more, that's, that should be more of a priority. And then there's always times during summer, during, um, breaks during the weekend where you can kind of bump up those other hours if you need to. All right. So our next question is, how was your transition to SBCC and did you have a hard time fitting in at all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm definitely shy by nature. So I, it, it was tough, especially um, I was a little bit older. So SBC, a lot of the students there are on the track right away they they go to SBCC right out of um out of high school and a lot of them it's actually kind of a feeder school where we had a lot of um students from other states who would move to SBCC maybe they were I had friends from Chicago that came specifically to SBCC so that they could get in-state residency status so that they could go to UCLA or S, you know UCSB or Berkeley or all of the California schools that are um that aren't very out of state friendly. So and live by the huge, beach and live by the beach and live in Isla Vista and do all the fun things that are are there. So um, for me, it was just that it was, I didn't go there specifically so I could go to a, um, a UC, although that is what ended up happening, but it was just that it was a better school near me locally. Um, so yeah, it was a little tricky because if anyone goes to SBCC, they know it's, um, we also had a lot of like um, international students from like Sweden when I was going. So, I mean, and you're right by the beach. So there is these like exchange students walking around in bikinis on campus. So I was definitely a little um, shy at the time, but it was fine. I think you've, you know, I was nerdy and I like to study and I liked biology. So I found my nerdy like to study biology people and we study together and it was great. Um, I think it's, you definitely find people that you have a lot in common with and then stick together. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of my classmates were also interested in medicine. So that, that made things easier. Um, we were able to connect on that. There were a lot of clubs that I was involved with the biology club. We also had a pre-med club at the time. Um, so you start finding your people through that. And I'm still really good friends with a lot of them. So it was definitely scary for me when I first transferred. Um, it had a different, there was a sense of academic intensity, that I really liked, but I was also, I wasn't sure if I was able to at the time. Remember, I had just come from Ventura College where I wasn't doing well in my classes. Um, and I had only recently kind of had this like um a like awakening experience where I was like, I'm gonna be a good student, I'm gonna go to medical school, I'm gonna make this happen. But I hadn't actually proven any that I could do that yet. I hadn't had any like tests yet. So it was helpful for that. Um, but yeah, as for fitting in, you find your people. Um you know, you start, I, I liked, to, I like to study at home now, but at the time I would make myself study at school so that I would see who else is in the library. And if I saw any of my classmates, maybe go say hi, even though I'm shy, um, just to kind of put myself out there. So yeah, you, you just, you'll find people. All right. Our next question. Can you repeat again, when you began studying for the MCAT, was it after you transferred to UCLA? So can you clarify the timeline? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I kind of glossed over it a little bit, but actually I got the Kaplan book series. I bought that when I was still at community college because a lot of my, at community college, I think there's a question later that I'll kind of go more into the exact courses I took, but um, a lot of them did end up being on the MCAT. So I bought that Kaplan book and I would kind of look to see, okay, 
in biology, we just learned about the filament model of muscle contraction. Um, I think they talk about that a little bit in my intro bio classes. And I would look inside my MCAT textbook to be like, what are we supposed to know about this? What's the level, like, what's the level of detail that I need to know? So I would kind of bounce back and forth just to see when I was taking the class, I would look over the topic as it was outlined in the Kaplan book, just to see, to make sure that I wasn't missing anything else that would be on the MCAT and that the MCAT um, level was requiring. So it wasn't official studying, but I, I think it was helpful for me to just kind of keep on top of it, to know what to expect and know what was coming and what I really needed to be focusing on um, for the MCAT. I had some friends at, um, at SBCC who started studying for the MCAT, like really started studying for the MCAT while they were still there. And that's something um, I didn't really touch on too much, but a lot of, when I transferred, when I transferred, I transferred as a junior and a lot of my classmates that I had been at UCLA for all four that had already been there for two years and were also starting their junior year, they had already taken the MCAT that summer. And that's kind of the traditional timeline to take it is the summer between sophomore and junior year, because then you get your score back. Or if you need to retake it, you have plenty of time to retake it in your junior year. And then you're able to send in your application in the summer between um, you can send in your med school application in the summer between your uh, the junior and senior year. So and then you can start medical school immediately after graduation, which I took two gap years. So it was fine for me. But if you want to go straight into it, um, some people do start studying for the MCAT while they're at community college, which is definitely doable. Um, you'll just have to be on top, you know, really making sure that you're on top of it. And you're also going to have to uh, familiarize yourself with like biochemistry, which isn't always offered at a community college and then also genetics. So it's definitely doable. Um, but yeah, for me personally, I wasn't too worried about the timeline of everything that was already, um, I don't know. I've always felt like I was a little behind the timeline, but I, it just doesn't worry me too much. Um, taking things on my own time. But if you want to go straight after you graduate from your transfer university, then you should start preparing for the MCAT during that um, while you're at community college and try to take it the summer before you transfer. Or at the latest, you could also take it the summer after your um, first year transferring. So that summer between junior and uh, senior year. And if you take it, then you will be able to apply still, but you might be applying a little bit later, or you may be applying without your MCAT score, which or you could also take it in the January of your um your first year at, after transferring. So there's there's a lot of different timelines that you could do. But yeah, I, I waited until I was actually done with my coursework for I, I was in the middle the end of my senior year that I took it. That was a long winded explanation. <laughs> All right, cool. So the next question is, how many hours per day do you usually study at in medical school? And can you work a job while studying for medical school? Do you have to volunteer as well during medical school? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So how many hours I study really does vary. Um, it, A lot of it depends on when the next exam is. So typically, I study... I, I go to lecture, so I kind of count that as like my first pass on studying, um, like my first time seeing content. A lot of people I know will like just kind of go over the content on their own, but I feel like um, going to class is kind of my introduction to the content. Sometimes I review the, um, we call them syllabus chapters, but they're not a syllabus like how they are in undergrad where it's just a list of like expectations. The syllabus is here. I can show you who are uh, like their textbooks written by the professors. And this is just for three weeks of material. So they're fun. Um, but I'll read the the syllabus textbook chapter before and then I go to class. Um, so I count that as studying, but officially, typically, um, I usually study maybe like an hour or two in the evenings just to kind of go over the content and to pre like preview the content that's coming up next. So that'll be like the first week before, um, like right after an exam. So the first week of material, typically my school is kind of organized in these three week blocks. So you have the first one where I'll study. That's when I'm studying like an hour, maybe in the evening. And then I study pretty intensely on the weekends when I have more free time. And then um, the second week, it starts stepping up a little bit. So maybe I'm going to spend a few more days where it's like I'm going to study for four hours that day. Um, and then the week before the exam, it's crunch time. New material is still coming at you really quickly. So those are the days that 
gosh, I mean, it'll be like a Tuesday and I'm up till one in the morning just studying, um, trying to stay on top of everything. So it really does vary. Um, and it also depends on the class. Like right now, my classes are I'm in cell biology, which my major was molecular cell and developmental biology. So I have a lot more of a background in that material than I did with the anatomy and physiology classes. So I had to study a lot more for those. Um, but yeah, it, it's I definitely study a lot more than I did during undergrad. Um, there's just a lot more material, too. And then also, I didn't mention it, but my school is a pass fail um, school. So you're not expected to know to it's not like how it is in undergrad where you're trying to get an A and trying to get this specific score in my school, you're just trying to pass. Um, or if you want, you, you can go for the top scores, which, um, sometimes I want to, but at the same time, it's almost impossible to get all of the material just because it's so intense and there's so much of it. So, um, just making sure that you really understand the concepts is what I go for. Anyway, it's, um, so yeah, it's, it really varies. And then as for volunteer, as for working a job during medical school, um, I mentioned before that I'm looking at a research position for medical devices, and that's actually a paid research position. So I'm going to be using that as my job. Um, I'm going to say most of this, pretty much everyone I know does not work, um, doesn't have like a second job on the side, just because there's so much to do. Um, it's really difficult um, to balance everything. Med school does kind of become your first your number one priority, um, just because of all the studying that you're expected to do. So like that's, I'm pretty happy that I found a paid position and I know some other people that are looking at paid positions. So I would recommend doing that if you can, but, um, student loans, honestly, everyone I know is we're just kind of living off student loans at the, at the time. Um, which is fine because that's what all medical students do and you're going to be able to pay them off. And it's scary for me be being in this much debt is definitely, kind of nerve wracking, but, um, it's just, it, it's the only way to do it because working and balancing med school is really difficult. And then as for volunteering, um, you are, you're not, ex you should be doing volunteering. I will say just for residency applications, they do want to see community service. They want to see you getting involved with different, um, organizations. You don't have to volunteer that much. Um, I've started volunteering a lot more often just because my schedules opened up quite a bit as compared to my first semester. My first semester, I didn't volunteer at this um, student clinic at all. I I did maybe a couple weekend volunteer projects just for things that I was interested in, but I didn't, I wasn't worried about like, oh, I need this on my resume. Um, but now that I have more free time, it's really interesting. And I do like working at the student run clinics because you see a lot of things that um, we just don't see in the classroom. And it kind of puts you know, sometimes it's so easy to get focused on study, study, study. I have to learn everything I know about the, you know, this the RAS pathway of, you know, aldosterone and all that. And it's so easy to get bogged down on the biology that I forget like, oh, I'm I'm going into medicine to be a to work with patients and to get to see people and, you know, work with people. So um it kind of puts things into perspective, volunteering. So that's been really enjoyable and something that I've really liked. Um, and it's not that much of a commitment. Typically, my school, even though um, my school, typically we end around three or four. So I have this time in the evenings and I'll go volunteer at the clinic for two or three hours and get to see a lot of different things. And it's a good time. Right. Next question. Other than research opportunities, what else do you recommend we get involved with while we're still at community college? Yeah, that's a great question. Um Research opportunities is definitely something I know um, REU project summer programs are a really good thing to get involved with. There's also um, clinical experience programs that you could be volunteering with. Um, volunteering at local clinics, too, is something um, just to start getting those experiences and start collecting those hours. Um, even working, you know, if you're working somewhere, um, that's another good thing just to to show that you're you're sticking with something and um doing things and then let's see other programs i think there's a lot of pre-med cc pro or videos about summer research programs i definitely would recommend taking a look at that um there's a lot of like outreach programs at different medical schools i knew one of my classmates had done um ucla had a summer program for students that were interested in medicine that were at community colleges a lot of ucs have very similar programs so i would you know, if there's somewhere that you're really interested in, I would start looking at those programs um, and getting involved with with them. 
So those are things you can do during the summer. And then um, during the rest of the year, I got involved with, you know, my school had a lot of leadership experience or opportunities. So there was the biology club, there's the pre-med club. There's, if your school doesn't have a pre-med club, you can start your own pre-med club. And that, that looks great. Um, they love to see people taking initiative like that. So I would definitely recommend, you know, start getting involved with those. Maybe there's tutoring that you can do. I have a lot of, um, now that I'm in medical school, I have, I had a lot of teaching in my, um, background from being a tutor, um, doing TA things. So being able to, schools really like to see teaching experience because a lot of medicine is ex teaching, especially once you become a resident, you're expected to teach medical students. So they like to see um, those sorts of experiences. So if your your school has like a tutoring program, that's something that would be really good to get involved with as well. Um, yeah, I think those are the big ones. And then also you can just, you can always volunteer in your um, community. That's, that's something, it doesn't even have to be medical or clinical. Um, if there's volunteer projects that you're interested in, it look schools like to see what you're passionate about. Yeah, in California, there's a thing called uh, Mesa Centers, STEM Centers. Um, those are STEM centers all across the country. But if you've done well for a class, they'll pay you to tutor, and that's kind of leadership. And um, there's a lot of things you can do at your campus. There's student government. There's honors clubs. There's hundreds of things you could do. So it doesn't have to be pre med per se. You can start your own chapter. We actually had a workshop a couple of months ago about how to start a pre-med chapter for AMSA. There's going to be one coming up for MAPS. So there's all these things you could do. So uh, what they say, the world is your oyster. So you could do whatever you want to do. And what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, because look, if, if medical schools tomorrow come and say you need to you know, be the president of a basket weaving class, like that's not something you're interested in, then don't do it, you know? Um, yeah, so I mean, do what things you're interested in and passionate about. There's no requirements. Um, no, there's and, no such thing as basket weaving for medical school. Somebody asked that question. I will say though, if you have hobbies that you're really interested in, stick, you know, those help your application stand out a lot. Um, I have classmates who played organ the instrument professionally um you know sports lots of tennis players basketball players um so even just you know lots of artists and horseback riding and people that are just really passionate about their hobbies they love to see that sort of stuff and it does set you apart because realistically a lot of people applying to medical school are going to be have good grades have you know done that work to get those leadership opportunities and pre-med things and have all these, you know, pre-med oriented applications. So when you have something that really shows who you are, um, they love to see that. And it, it does, it does help you stand out. All right. So the next question is, which classes did you take um, at community college um, to prepare for med school? Yeah. So I took, um, to prepare for med school, I took a lot of my prereq. I think I took most of my prereq classes at community college. I had mentioned that earlier, but um, I'm just going to count them off just to kind of go down the line. But most medical schools want to see that you've taken math classes um, up to a calculus level, a statistics class. Uh, they want to see a year of biology. They want to see a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry with labs, typically for both OCHEM and regular chem. Um, physics, some schools want to see physics, some don't, but, um, it, for me, it's a, it was a transfer requirement. So I, I did do my physics as well. Uh, they also like to see, uh, English, you have to have an English class and then trying to think it, it, there, it basically completely overlapped with the, I get C requirements for transferring. So, um, from UCLA, o o -chem. I, I mentioned OCHEM. Yeah. OCHEM oh, was one of them. Also, I took psychology, sociology. Um, I took those classes at uh, the community college. I I don't think they were requirements for my major for transfer, but they were requirements for medical schools. A lot of them do want to see psychology or sociology. So, I mean, I took, I think I took everything. Um, the only class that I took that was a pre-med requirement afterwards was um, was biochemistry and genetics. Those were the two that I took after transferring that were requirements for some schools, but for the most part, everything I took at a community college. Um, another thing that I did at the community college was get involved in the anatomy lab. So my school had um, 
we had cadavers. We had a cadaver program. So they would get a new cadaver every semester. And then they had a student team of dissectors who could um, dissect the cadaver. So that was something that was really unique to Santa Barbara City College. And actually one of the main reasons that I went there was um, I wanted to be in a part of that program. So I took anatomy there. I did well in the anatomy class and I expressed my interest pretty early to the professor that I did want to join the the dissection team. And then I ended up doing that um, my second semester at SBCC. So that was a really cool experience. And that was another unique thing where, you know, if you, I definitely recommend looking at the community colleges around your area and seeing, okay, which one do I want to go to? Which one has a good biomedical program. Um, what are some unique experiences I can get there that I may or may not, maybe there's a school closer to you, but it doesn't have those opportunities. So. All right. Next question. Would you say that a couple of bad grades in community college will completely affect the application for med school or not so much? Yeah, I, I would say not so much. It, a couple bad grades, it can definitely, um, I had to include all of my grades on my med school AMCAS transcript. So even though I had gotten, I said before I had two Fs on my transcript and I'd gotten them forgiven by my my community college. I'd gotten, um, I'd done grade forgiveness and gotten those wiped from my record. So they didn't impact my GPA as an undergrad. Med school does not care. And they definitely made me put those down. And that was not, that was not fun, but um, it's fine. It really is, you know, nobody maybe there's a few people out there who have these perfect GPAs, but for the most part, we all have different, you know, there's little things that come up. So I I wouldn't say that it affects you. Um, I think the more, com what they're really looking for is to see that, that grade progression. They want to see an upward trend that, you know, maybe you didn't do well your first semester and maybe, you know, or your first year, and maybe you got a C or a few or some, you know, something happened and then you retook the class. And then afterwards you're demonstrating that, okay, I'm able, it shows resiliency. Honestly, it shows that, Hey, I can get knocked down. I cannot do as well, but that's not going to stop me from picking myself up and improving afterwards. Yeah. We've done a lot of workshops on people that I think in a couple of weeks, you we have somebody who failed like 13 classes in community college. And now they're going to graduating as an honor student from med school. The person that leads all the UC medical schools failed organic chemistry. So yeah, so I think I think you can't change your past. I mean, if you've done bad, you know, you can't change the past. You can only change the present and the future. So, and you're the only person that could um, that could do that, and that includes looking inwardly and saying what you did wrong. Um, like for example, if you got an F in the class because you didn't go to class and didn't read and didn't do the homework and stayed home and played video games, then probably that's or maybe different learning styles maybe if you're taking a um, math class maybe you didn't do enough problem sets so figuring out what those things are but get bad grades like you can't change that you could only change what you could do today and tomorrow and I think you know Madeline is the testament of that that she basically failed a couple of classes and learned how to study and did really well at Santa Barbara, then went to UCLA and graduated with a 4.0. So you could do it. It's just, and med schools are going to look for that as kind of like, okay, this person is serious, self-evaluated, has done all that stuff. Um, but, you know, um, I guess stressing over it or, uh, I don't know, stressing over it is not really not going to do much, um, except, you know, you know, kind of depress you about it. But, but I think, you know, every, you know, and part of growing up is, is self evaluating, evaluating yourself and uh, self reflection as well. And I think that's, that's important. So if yeah. Madeline can do it, so can you. I mean, I, I completely agree, though, it really it shows schools want to see somebody who's reflective and introspective, because med school does knock you down, even if you're doing great in school. Um, it, it's tough. It's really, really difficult. And that's something that they warned us about during our orientation week is that a lot of students are coming in being like, oh, I'm so smart. I'm going to, you know, get straight A's just like I've been doing. And you're not. Um, it's just impossible. You're not, your grades are going to go down a little bit. I mean, I've seen 
videos where it's just like getting a seven, you know, getting a 68% in undergrad and it's like, I got a D and getting a 68% in medical school on an exam. It's like, let's go party. I did awesome. Like it's, it's really difficult. So um, schools understand that and they just want to see resiliency. So if you struggled early on in your undergrad career, and then like, like Jubin was saying, and you learn your, you know, self-evaluate, learn your different studying style, styles, you know, seek help and make a change like that really, that looks really good. Um, they really like to see that. And then also something that I didn't mention before, but if you're working or if you have outside commitments, schools understand that too. Um, and if anything, it shows resiliency. So if you're, you know, if, if you have other commitments outside of school and maybe that are, that you have to, you have to work so that you're able to support yourself, schools will understand that. And, um, if it shows strength that you're, you know, pushing forward and doing that, especially, you know, if there's other difficulties in your life, you're taking care of a family member, like you can explain that if, you know, it shows resiliency. So I think, although it's important to have good grades and you do want to work hard and do the best of your ability, if there are other things out there, um, you will have an opportunity to talk about those in your secondaries. You will have an opportunity to talk about in your personal statement and how it made you a stronger person and will make you a better doctor. So having a few grades, bad grades early on in undergrad, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, schools look at more than just your grades. This is kind of like a question that I have, but um, what kinds of like extracurriculars did you do at UCLA to prepare for med school? Um, and then how did you get uh, involved in the nosistology technician job that you did over the two gap years? Yeah, that's a great question. At UCLA, it was a little tricky because I transferred um, I transferred in fall 2019 and then COVID hit. So a lot of things kind of went off. Um, but at UCLA, I was involved with UMA, which I really like UMA um, Community Clinic. I would definitely recommend if you're at UCLA um, looking them up. It was It's a community clinic that was founded by the um, Muslim Medical Students Association in response to the um, uh, civil unrest in the 1992 in Los Angeles. So they wanted to create, um, they noticed that, you know, there's not a lot of healthcare. There's like healthcare deserts basically and food deserts in South Central. So um, a group of medical students created this free clinic. Um, super accepting club. They were really, you know, if you're passionate about healthcare and you're passionate about serving underserved communities, they'll accept everyone. Um, and I really liked working with them. So I would definitely recommend UMA. There's a lot of other, at least when I was, there, there were a lot of other undergrad like clubs and um, pre-med societies and I think like struck force and things like that. But um, what I noticed, I, I hope this has changed, but there was a little bit of a transfer, not stigma, but um, they they wanted to see experience. They wanted to see that you were volunteering without being a part of the club early on. And like, so if you were a transfer student, you know, trying to get in a leadership position or trying to get involved in your you know, junior year, um, there were a lot of like people that have been trying to get in since they were freshmen and sophomores. So they kind of gave preference to the ones that had been trying longer, even though like it, it was a little unfair, honestly. Um, so yeah, I would definitely at UCLA look around at the different clubs. I hope that has changed. Um, but there's other, there's other opportunities available that you don't have to go through UCLA officially. I know you could also do, um, this one is through UCLA, but you could do volunteering at the hospital is always a big one. And then also just looking around Los Angeles has a lot of different opportunities that might not be officially affiliated with um, the school itself. So you can always find free clinics to volunteer, um, reach out to some community clinics or to some food distribution or different services um, and offer to volunteer, maybe not through an organized way. And that's that's regardless of where you live. That's um, a good thing to do. And then as for getting involved with Moe's histology technician, that's actually, um, that's a unique to California thing. It's very frustrating. Um, I live in New York now and I'm skilled in this highly competitive, I mean, they pay very, very well in New York, but you have to have a certificate, which I don't have and you don't need in California. So getting involved with Moe's histology technician, I just looked up Mo. I just looked up histology. I think I was looking at laboratory jobs. Um, during my gap year, but I looked, I stumbled across histology technicians and you don't have to have a certificate to join them. Um, yeah, I can put my email in there and kind of reach out and talk a little bit. I, I worked for a company um, and I know that they're hiring in the all of California area. Um, so I could give a little bit more information about that, but I probably shouldn't do it 
recorded. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they're a great company. And I really, I loved working with them, but I could, that's something that I'll put my email on and I can talk about a little bit more. Go ahead, Mindy. Okay. Uh, should I include small leadership opportunities in my application. I was a secretary of my honors club for one semester, didn't really do much other than taking notes. So wondering if I should include that type of experience. That's a good question. That's something um, when I was looking back at my, my medical school application, I did. And it's tough. You have 15, um, ex like 15 experiences that you're allowed to include. So I think it depends. I did use all 15, I think, but um, looking back on it, I probably, there were a couple where I was like, should I really have included that? Um, did I have anything meaningful? Did this add anything meaningful to my application? Um, if it, I think it really depends on where you at, where you're at in your application process. If you're still pretty early on um, and there's other things you could pursue that, you know, for example, that was a leadership opportunity. If you're trying to find a leadership opportunity, maybe try to, you know, look for something in the future that you can have a little bit more insight about that you can, um, you know, maybe get a little more involved with, or just be able to talk about a project that you did. Because if it's just, if there's nothing that, you know, impactful about it, um, it's there, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily strengthen your application. I feel like you know, they're going to be reading a list of these experiences. And even if you don't have all 15 done, if you only have good, impactful experiences, that's going to be a lot more um, interesting for the person reading your application. They're going to be like, oh, wow, this, you know, these are really cool. Um, versus if you have a couple kind of like, eh, what, am, you know, it, it feels like it's just filling up, taking up space. I don't know. I might be wording this wrong, but um. I, I feel like you want to walk away with something that you learned in that experience. And maybe, you, you know, if you still have time, I would look for other things. But if you're not sure that it was really um, impactful, then, you know, maybe not included. That was something that I, I looked back at my application and I thought I probably didn't need to mention this one or I could have worked this into something else because um, just reading them back, it kind of felt a little flat to me. Um, and that's okay. I mean, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but I feel, you know, you only have so much space and that person who's reading your application is reading a lot of them in a row. So um, I feel like it's a good use of your time to really make sure that um, what you have down hits. And Yeah. And the only thing about that, if you're a second year community college student, you got what, three, four more years that you could add things to it. And so look at being a secretary of your honors club as an entry point coordinate a blood drive, do something, do a workshop. There's like hundreds of things you could do. Um, so, I mean, like taking notes at a meeting, I mean, that's, you know, that's basically very, you know, minimal effort, but put an effort into doing, there's hundreds of things you could do. You could do, one of the other things, there's an organization called Books for Africa, where you could uh, collect all the people that can't sell their books um, to the bookstore and collect them and send them to, you know, this organization that sends them to Africa. There's hundreds of things you could do, but you just need to put some time and effort into it. You know, taking, you know, being a recording minutes at a meeting that you're at, it's not, it's very minimal. So there's hundreds of things you could do and look at that as an entry point and yeah. other things. That, like Jubin said, that is a really good opportunity for your, that's a good thing to put on your resume to get something that maybe will feel a little more impactful. Like you, you know, there's a lot of things you're getting your foot in the door is really, really important. And then being able to build up your resume enough to get the experiences that show that you're passionate about. And, you know, it's definitely a good experience. Um, but if you're not hundred percent sure if you want it on, you know, if you're kind of unsure about if you should include it on your application, that's probably a pretty good indication that it might not be the best thing to include. So this next question is from a student um, who goes back to their home country in the summer to visit the family. Um, and they're able to get volunteering and shadowing opportunities there, but they're scared that medical, uh, medical um, um, admissions would accept their activity hours in a different country. And so they just wanted to hear about any advice that you might have about that. 
Yeah, I think that's um that's a really good question. And it's definitely I think it's a really good experience. So there's um there's kind of a current like conversation going on in um applications for like med school and PA schools about like um medical tourism, they call it, which that's I think that might be something that you're alluding to is, you know, are they going to be okay with these hours in a different country? They, you know, there's programs where you can pay money to go volunteer in a different country and gain clinical experience and hands-on skills. But a lot of it, the ethics of it are a little iffy because a lot of times it's, you're paying money to travel to a country where you're doing things that you wouldn't be able to do in the United States because there's more regulation, I think is the indication. That's not, that 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 can be kind of iffy but what you're describing going back to your home country where you're you know volunteering and shadowing where you're visiting family like that is a strong connection to this place and i think you know absolutely um schools would like to hear about that that's really important um i would not be afraid to put i would be you should put that down that sounds like a really good experience and it's um it's also ties to your culture and it shows a bit about who you are as a person and your background and where you come from that's something i really like about my school is how we have people from such different backgrounds with different perspectives and experiences and um it makes things more unique schools like to have a class that's diverse and has students from different places and that have different experiences so definitely i would definitely um put that down and talk about it and then also it gives you a little bit of a global health perspective which um you know, if that's something you're interested in, global health, that's something you can talk about. And that's a good way to get experience there. So yeah, um, they would want your activity hours in that. And I think that would, that would be a really good experience and to look into things. All right. Next question. If planning to take one to two gap years, is it okay to take the MCAT during or after senior year? Yeah, that's what I did. So definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, I took the MCAT, uh, at the end of kind of this like weird period, because I graduated a little bit early and then I took the MCAT in spring or I started studying for the MCAT in spring of my senior year and then took it in August after I graduated. And um, I could have applied right. I thought about applying and just taking one gap year. So I thought about taking my MCAT and then um, also doing my application that same summer and sending them both in at the same time. And then taking just one gap year because the application cycle takes a full year, um, which was not a fun year, by the way. But um, <laughs> you guys, you got this. Um, anyway, you could do that. That's definitely an option. I just wanted to get more clinical experience before I applied. So that's why I decided to take two gap years. Um, but yeah, you can definitely take your, um, I, I think taking it during, I, I personally liked taking it after I graduated. Um, the MCAT because I think it gave me more time to study. And then also I had so much um, experience from my major to kind of help me through the MCAT. Um, and I, like I had taken biochemistry and genetics and I had been in a lot of journal clubs and um, learned how to read scientific articles. And that really helped me on my MCAT. So I think that that's totally fine. So this student has heard about um, like different med school um, grading systems, like pass fail systems and um, honor systems. Um, which one do you think is better? So my school actually has both. Um, we do have a pass fail system for everyone, but then there's also an honor system within that. So we do get, there are grades associated. Um, we get like percentile scores. So I definitely am a fan of the pass fail system because I think it takes a lot of pressure off. I guess we call it pass, no pass. They don't call it a fail because, but um, they call it, you know, I think it's, it depends on the school. Um, I know how I really like how mine does it where a, I think it's two standard deviations um, for a pass. So that, that really does help. It's um, it, it, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Um, so we do have we do have grades associated. So you can get honors on exams if you are two standard deviations above the mean. Um, and then we have some classes where it's kind of a hard cutoff as well. So if everyone in the class does well and the mean is in the 80s, then you just have to get above a 75, I believe, for some classes to pass. But then if everyone does poorly and the mean is in the 60s, then you just have to be stu two standard deviations below the mean to pass to not pass. So that's, that really is a pretty small percentage when it, when all is said and done. Um, so I think that takes a lot of pressure off, but there's also an honor system. So if you do well, you know, 
I feel like that incentivizes everyone to study as hard as they can and to do as well as they can. Instead of just being like, oh, I'm probably going to pass because unless I'm in the, you know, bottom 7% or whatever, like then it's iffy. But for the most part, everyone's doing their best because they do want to get those honors. Um, and then also for the honor system, I believe it's the, um, there's an honor society and it's not a, grades are definitely a part of it. I think you have to be in the top 75% of your class. I believe that I, don't quote me on that, but um, there's a percentile, but they also like to see that you're involved in research. They like to see that you're involved in community projects, that you're doing things other than just getting good grades. And um, the schools nominate who's promoted to the honor society based on um, grades are a part of it, but then also just your involvement in other activities. And I think it's, they can invite up to, I believe it's, 80 15 percent of their class can be nominated to it depending on the size of the school so it, it kind of depends but I think both have their merits um I like the pass fail system though and I do think most medical students do it really does take a lot of pressure off trying to get an A on everything which sometimes for some of these classes is really I'm not going to say impossible but um maybe a little bit impossible <laughs> so uh I think that takes a lot of a lot of pressure off yeah, the only thing that I would add is that um, most medical schools are pass fail in the U.S. and the honors. Some schools, I don't know which ones. I, I, I mean, I know some, but I don't know every single one of them. That you honor your third and your fourth year on your rotations, and that means if you do really well and they really like you, and they could, you would honor in that as well, and also on your shelf exam. So it just, it all depends. I mean, but I think most medical schools are um pass fail in the u.s yeah I, th that's a good point I, I forgot to mention my school actually does like she was saying for um clinical years third and fourth year you can we do switch over from um a strict pass no pass system to honors and that's um i can't remember the exact grading but i think there's like six different levels so there's one fail level and then it's like pass marginal pass high pass honors high honors i think where one of them is fail, but um, I don't think anyone really fails those. You fail if you don't show up and yeah, you don't you listen. And yeah, you don't listen and do all that stuff. And I think the honors part of it just um, is that if you really want to go into that specialty. So let's say if you want to go into surgery, probably should honor in surgery and just pass, I don't know, psychiatry. I mean, that's one example. And and uh, to answer the question for pass fail, it's pass fail for your entire grade. Yes. Mm -hmm. And no, you should and in medical school you should not fail any classes. And and yeah, and, and just talk about how hard it is to fail in medical school. Yeah, they don't want you to fail. They're gonna do everything they can to support you. Um so you can't, like Jubin mentioned briefly, so I, I was kind of focused on exams because that's how my med school brain is. We're just focusing on one test at a time. But um, so you can, you could not pass an exam and you can fail two exams. I know of a, I know someone who failed two exams and still passed completely um, because there's remediation efforts. Like they don't want you to fail. It doesn't look good for a med school to have a lot of students who fail, first of all. And then also once you're out, they you, they your tuition dollar like they can't have somebody transfer in and take your space so that's once they lose someone in the class that's financially isn't really they don't want that either um which is kind of cold to say but it's it, it is a fact of it they really don't want to lose you so it's difficult to fail in med school even if you fail of course um there's remediation efforts through you can take Again, during the summer, you can retake the year. Like they're going to do everything they can to pass you. And then um, if you fail, at least at my school, they give you a lot of extra support. So you get a one-on-one -on -one tutor. You get um, a chance to retake it. I I don't know exactly what the retaking process is. I, I've heard different stories. Nobody really talks about it. It's kind of one of those things where it's very hush-hush. So even people that have failed don't really advertise that, um, which is difficult. But I've heard rumors that it's a like almost like a 
you make up the answers that you missed and then have to explain why you missed them. But I'm, I'm not sure. Regardless, it, it is really difficult to fail a class in medical school. Once you get in, they're going to do everything they can to keep you there. All right, next question. I'm applying for a student helper job in a research project at a hospital, I know. Does this count as employment or does it count as research? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think once you have the job um, and once you're working in it, you'll you'll probably have a little bit, bit better of an idea of what to count it as. Um, my, you know, I think with research, they want to see you... What they're really looking for is they want to see you asking research questions and learning how to develop, like how to work through the scientific method and develop a research proposal and how to find different ways to like use techniques to answer a question. So I think with research, it's kind of a tricky one. Um, I don't think, I think this might, if you're assisting, like I, I had some lab assistants where I was working in a lab doing more like, um, like text type work. Um, and I counted that as employment rather than research, even though technically it was in a research lab. So I think once you're working there, you'll have a little bit more of an idea, but I, I, from what it sounds like, it does sound like that would fall under the employment. But again, that's a really good experience for you're working in a lab, you're working as a helper. If you want to start developing research questions and maybe move up within that, um, that position, then you could pivot kind of, you could have it as both where, um, I've heard things about splitting hours too, where some people say you use the same job, but under two different, um, like put one under research and one under employment and just split that the difference of the hours. Um, but I, I've, from what I've heard from medical school admissions, they don't like to see that they, um, they want you to kind of stick with one thing. So yeah, that, that's a tricky one. So this next question comes from a student who had to drop human anatomy twice due to health issues. And so they're asking if there's any advice on how to get grade forgiveness at community colleges in California and if it'll ruin their chances of getting into medical school. Um, I had to get grade forgiveness. Um, I mentioned that before. So I will preface and say that it does, it will be on your medical school application. Um if you get even if you get uh, grade forgiveness, you yeah, still I think I think they're getting a W. Um so it's fine. Yeah, W is fine. And if you have a W, if you have a health condition, you just get a doctor's note and they could give you an excuse W, which basically means that you had a good reason to do it. So that shouldn't affect you at all. Like it's a, uh, what is it? Not It's an ADA issue. So if you had the, yeah, so you'll be fine. And I had a lot of unexcused Ws and they didn't care either. Just, um, <laughs> Just um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't even think you need to get grade forgiveness for a, for W's excused or not. Um, if you want to, you could talk to your counselor about it. But honestly, I would save the grade forgiveness. Um, I think you can only do it once or twice. There's a limit on how many times you can get grade forgiveness. So I would I wouldn't use it just for a W. Um, I think you should should save it for something else. If it's a drop. I can't remember if drop comes up differently on your transcript, but yeah, a drop comes up as a W. Okay. And that's then okay. and then uh and then you could just get an EW if it was for a medical condition or health condition. Mm -hmm. But it won't it won't ruin your chances. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Next question. Have you heard some really varied experiences regarding uh, long knock shifts? Are there any options if I have a condition that has to do with sleep? I think it's long night shifts. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that would, if you have conditions that have to do with sleep, that would be something you'd want to talk to your school about. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. As for night shifts, there are, in medical school at least, there aren't night shifts at mine. Um, that might depend on the school. There, But from what I've heard, I mean, we have a surgery rotation where you have to be up at, everyone talks about that one. I think you need to be at, on in the unit by 5 a.m. Um, and those can be really long days. But I have not heard of any overnight shifts. Um, that would be something that if the school that you're looking at does have overnight shifts um, or if you have a sleep condition, 
that would be something to talk to. Um, schools have disability offices. They have different um, like resources, um, equity offices. So things like that, you could talk to them about that um, and they could help you work around that if, if you need to. Um, they're going to do everything they can to support you. But um, as for medical training, I, I don't think, I don't know of any schools off the top of my head that do have overnight shifts. I know personally mine doesn't. Um, I don't think it's very common, but it, it will be common in residency. So that's something depending on what field you go to into residency. So that is something that you'll want to be cautious of. I don't know. Jubin works overnight shifts. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you have to talk to them because if you're not doing night shift, that means somebody else has to cover for you. And I don't know, like I have no, I don't know. I think that's a, something that has to be discussed with them. So I don't know. I like working night shifts just because that's the only time I could work. And instead of sleeping, I work. So that's just me. Okay, that pretty much wraps up Q&A so far. Does anyone else have any other questions you'd like to ask Madeline? Okay, we have one. Um, if we would like to learn more about the histology program that you're part of, how could we learn more about it? Yeah, let me pop in. I'm going to put my email in the chat real quick. Um, I mean... I think it's fine, actually. I can just, I can mention right here. I worked for a company called Mo's Pros. If you live in California, I really liked Mo's Pros. Um, they do require you to, I, I think you have to have an associate's degree to do it. So if you're still in a community college, that might not be the best option. And then typically um, I was working in dermatology offices. It was like a full day of work. So you have to have like a full day free or uh, a lot of times you would be done by three at the latest. So if you're taking like a night class or something, that's also doable. Um, there's no work on the weekends though. Uh, so I, I really liked my company. Um, I was sad to have to leave it, but I had to go to medical school. So they understood. Um, but yeah, so I'll put that, I'll just pop that in the chat. They really are. I, I liked them a lot and I know they're growing. Um, I can't access the, oh, it's hiding. Struggling with Zoom. Sorry guys, technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, and then I'll also put my email in there if, if you have questions about it and are interested. Um, they're a California based company though. So I think actually they opened some offices in Texas since I've been there, but they were, I, I really liked working with them and it was a really unique and different experience. Um, and it gave me a lot of insight on dermatology and, uh, working in a really fast paced environment too. And then just some like unique clinical skills, like the histology, being able to work with a cryostat, the, um, the machine that I showed is a really unique skill and, um, will be very helpful in medicine. Um, like if you're looking for research positions in medical school. So I've liked, I've been able to talk about that a lot, um, for applications. So yeah, that's, that's that. Any yeah. other last minute questions in the chat? All righty. Well, if nobody else has any questions, we shall let you go. All right. No more questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Madeline, for showing up today and for you yeah. giving us your entire. It was really helpful actually to see like your MCAT um, study timeline because I'm also I'm in the process of um, trying to figure out like when to study for the MCAT. Um, so that was kind of that was really helpful to see. That's awesome. I I took that actually. Um, Trinity and I gave a talk a couple like about a year and a half ago, and I just copy and pasted that from there. So That's um, great, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's tr like you know I think she did it in a shorter amount of time or we had like different schedules. So it was cool to, I'm glad it helped out. And yeah. Are you in your senior year? Or? Oh, yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a third. I just said uh, transferred. So this is my second quarter um, okay. at UCLA, but yeah, I was planning to, I was thinking about this summer, perhaps like next year, 